This is the NSS Heritage Panel, um, and because we're running late, I'm going to bring up Paul Danfus, our Executive Director, to uh, introduce the panel members. Paul? Thank you, Rick, and I'm going to follow in that same spirit of being very, very brief. You guys have been listening to me talk and do costume changes over the last uh, three days or so. Um, so I'm going to make my comments very, very brief. But this is, this is a really exciting panel. Um, when, we, when we started doing the, the ISDC planning, and obviously this is our 25th anniversary, um, we said, well, we need to do some, some heritage uh, recognition. So we, 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 uh, we talked about bringing in some of the, uh, the former leaders of our parent organizations, the National Space Institute and the L5 Society. Um, and if you look in your program, it's page six and seven, the actual uh, proclamation that was signed by Ben Bova and Gordon Woodcock 25 years ago is in the program, so you can read through that, and that's the proclamation that merged the two organizations. And we also have a nice paper in here by, uh, by Art Dula. So uh, in the spirit of speeding things up, I'm going to ask our, uh, our panelists to come on up. I guess we've got a couple of them here. And let's please welcome them to the stage. So, like I said, I'm not going to make too many uh, opening comments, but I'll just introduce our, uh, our panelists very, very quickly. From your uh, left to your right, we have Fred Ordway, uh, Miss Lori Garver, Ben Bova, and Art Dula. And we are going to reflect a little bit on, on the two parent organizations, the merger, and then we'd like to look at some of the years in between. But just like everything else that we've been doing in the conference, we're, we're, we're spending some time to look back, but we're also doing it with an eye toward the future. If you were at our gala the other night, the theme was standing on the shoulders of giants as we recognized John Glenn and Scott Carpenter, but more importantly was looking forward as to what you know, the great things that they've set us up to do in space and, and the great things that, that will be uh, to come. So we'll, we'll try to put uh, the future of the National Space Society in perspective, but uh, just for a few moments we're going to reflect on the, on the past. So. Um, Lori, I'd like to uh, open up with you if you'd like to uh, make just a few opening remarks, and, and we're going to turn this into an interactive thing, so we're going to uh, open it up for you all's questions. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. It is great to be here at ISDC again. I uh, feel like uh, everyone else on the stage has a deeper history than I do in this, but I will quickly let you know when I came, it was the 10th anniversary of the National Space Institute, and I was hired by Dr. Glenn Wilson. I worked for a couple of days under Dr. Chartrand, the executive director, uh, but it was really, I came in with uh, Glenn Wilson, who was the executive director uh, for those first uh, four and a half years that I was there. Ben was the president of uh, NSI, and uh, Fred was a vice president at the time. Uh, I remember with, with Fred, I ha he signed the checks, so he was a very helpful individual. I came to NSS in response to an advertisement for a secretary, bookkeeper, receptionist in 1984. And I remember at the time Glenn Wilson interviewed me, he said, well, you know, there's going to be a lot of opportunity here for a smart young person. And if you play your cards right in 10 years, uh, you could have my job. And just with my personality, you can imagine what I was thinking, right? Not going to take me that long, buddy. <laughs> And it didn't. He retired about four and a half years later, and I became executive director at the age of 27. And I stayed there for about 12, uh, 12 years. But during that period of time uh, was a very exciting time for the Institute first and then the society. Glenn on the um, NSI side drove those negotiations with Mark Hopkins. They literally took years. It was good preparation for working at NASA having a lot of detailed negotiations of bylaws. I would just highlight that during uh, that time, I, I learned so much. I really grew up at the Space Institute and Space Society, got my master's at night in space policy, and really reached out to, I think, a lot of people, many of you in the room, but I would highlight Charlie Walker, who I reached out to, who ended up becoming extremely active for over a decade, Lockheed Martin, his his supervisor at Lockheed Martin, John Yardley, 
allowed him to spend half his time doing NSS work. That was fabulous. And Buzz Aldrin, I remember the day I called you, Buzz, and asked if you'd be chairman. You asked what that would really entail, and uh, I had to be honest and tell you signing fundraising and membership letters. And you said, well, that's fine, but I want to be more involved in that. And that was a wonderful thing, and I appreciate that you're still here. Um, uh, I, w I would highlight, I mentioned Mark Hopkins, I haven't seen him yet, but he uh, not only on the L5 Society did those ne merger negotiations, but really was very welcoming, as were all the L5 people when, after the merger, I came in. Dale Amon's here, he was on the board, lots of those original board members. I was a, a young person from NSI, just very excited by the energy of the merger. My first chapters meetings, I, I, my first ISDCs, because we didn't have those on our side. And uh, it was a wonderful thing to have the energy, I think, of the merged organization. And I loved the history of both. I think it's a testament to the society that it has remained strong after that merger. A couple quick highlights during my tenure, starting the Young Astronauts Program was something Glenn led at the National Space Institute, which is, I think, ongoing and has uh, really helped change uh, and, uh, the space program. I remember testifying the Augustine Committee, the first Augustine Committee, so I've joked with Norm that I was obviously impressed then and helping get him to do another one later. I was, as they say, great with child at the time. It was 1991, Wes was born in 92, and so that made an impression on the, on the panel, but I stated at that time, well, here you're asking the National Space Society to testify about the importance of the future of the space program. I've never been asked by the NASA administrator to speak to him. I've never met, met him. The next day I got a call. Dick truly asked for a meeting. Uh, so my, my, my pushiness sometimes did pay off for the Space Society. Uh, another occasion like that, I got a call from a key appropriations staffer in the middle of a battle whether we were going to support space exploration initiative uh, going beyond again. And at that time, all of the senior people within the sort of status quo space program only wanted us to support space station and they did not want us to go beyond, they thought it would risk the current program. Does that sound familiar? So uh, this Hill staffer calls because all of you were writing and calling and bothering their offices and said, call off your dogs, you know, this isn't helpful. We're not, uh, you know, helping. And I said, you know, they wouldn't stop if I told them to. This is something they feel strongly about, and they're going to support it. Uh, same thing happened. A major aerospace company called and said they were not going to continue their funding of us if we didn't just focus on space station. Well, I said, sorry. That's, uh, you know, you're, I believe, writing off your contribution as a tax deductible, and that can't really come with any policy strings. So no, we're not going to be able to do that. And we didn't do that, and they never withheld their funding. But uh, those kind of calls weren't weren't easy. And then finally, in um, 96, I did get a call from the administrator, Dan Golden, who asked if I would come to NASA, said, you've done such a good job on the outside, but I really think I need you more inside to sort of break some of the uh, log jam we have on the inside as well. So uh, it was a wonderful time there. I've continued to be involved in my government role. I've joked that my government role is definitely more limited than my National Space Society role since our goal on the Space Society side is to create a spacefaring civilization, and the NASA role of that is really quite, quite small, being, you know, the tip of that spear and trying to uh, reduce the cost of technologies and open up space so that more, more people can go. We've had some good wins with it, that this week, and I am here to tell you those absolutely, no question in my mind, would not have happened without the National Space Society and its precursor organizations. What you have done in, in teaching me and others about the importance of uh, our investment in space to open up space for humanity is um, uh, absolutely instrumental to our success. But then the, the first, my, re my first reading of you know, the high road and how a good little Democrat like me can actually believe that uh, the private sector are going to be the ones to open this up with the right incentives. And I just don't happen to believe as a capitalist that is a partisan thing. It seems to me in this country that's what we do. And so uh, it's been a wonderful organization throughout its history, and it's been a pleasure to be a part of it, and you should all be very proud. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. And, and, you know, it should be noted that just uh, just as on Friday morning as we were able to schedule the uh, the, the grappling and birthing of, of, uh, of the SpaceX Dragon during the administrator's uh, speech, 
we were able to get Lori uh, after coming back from a long flight from the other side of the planet. Uh, so we really appreciate her coming here, and that's in our bid to advance uh, high-speed point-to-point uh, suborbital uh, vehicles. I always, I always bring that up when people come off of flights from Australia and other points uh, around the world, but uh, we really appreciate uh, your effort. Uh, Fred, would you like to make some uh, comments this well, morning? I'd like to make some comments. I uh, had left Huntsville. I, I joined the Verna Von Braun team in Huntsville, Alabama at the Army Ballistic Missile Agency in 1956 and moved and worked in Huntsville uh, for a number of, uh, quite but maybe a year when they sent me back to Washington uh, as the liaison between the uh, brand new NASA, which was created in 1958, and the Army Ballistic Missile Agency, and also the new Advanced Research Projects Agency, ARPA in those days, DARPA today, that had been created. And the Army had resisted from the beginning to transfer its Verna von Braun uh, team uh, to the new NASA, and it finally did that under the urging of President, five-star general in World War II, Eisenhower, and so we had the official transfer uh, from the Army uh, on the 1st of July, and one of my most memorable uh, 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 incidents is, uh, uh, in September of that year, General President Eisenhower came to Huntsville with Mrs. Uh, uh, George C. Marshall, the widow of, of the uh, Chief of Staff during World War II and later Secretary of State, and transferred the brand new Gen uh, George C. Marshall Space Flight Center to Dr. Verna von Braun just years earlier, you know, a mortal enemy of the United States of America. And I thought that could only happen uh, in this country. It was amazing. In any event, I joined the von Braun team. I had met him in, uh, as early as 1952 in New York when I was working first at Reaction Motors and later at the Guided Missile Division of Republic. And I was very active in the American Rock Society and American Astronautical Society activities, and we got to know each other and became quite good friends in, the, in that context of his giving lectures and meetings and so forth and serving on the board of these various societies. And then I got a, uh, a letter he wrote and he said, Fred, we got the big one. But that meant the uh, uh, initial ARPA funding for the Saturn V uh, 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 a large rocket. Uh, and if you make the mistake of your life if you don't join me in Huntsville, and I eventually accept it. In the meantime, uh, in Washington, now I'm now in Washington, um, James Fletcher, the new administrator after Tom Paine had left of NASA, and Ed Yule, the president of Fairchild uh, uh, out in the Maryland suburb, had discussed about a, setting up an organization that would combine the professionals and the lay public, professionals who were space cadets like I was, but I was also professionally involved, and the general public. And uh, they assigned a man named Tom Turner uh, to prepare a feasibility study. I'd known Tom since we both used to work at Republic, he at the, at the Airplane Division and I at the Guided Missile Division on Long Island. So we were friends going way back from the middle, uh, the early 50s. And he prepared the feasibility study of a, uh, of a new institute uh, that would combine professional people and the public that were just fascinated with space and look forward to the dawn of a space uh, settlements of the solar system kind of organization. It was very exciting. Tom finished his study, uh, presented it first of all to the National Space Club here in Washington, which I was a member, to see if they might be interested in maybe modifying their presence and using their name. They uh, turned it down. So we had meetings in Washington in, in the late 19... Uh, uh, 74, and we debated association, and somebody said, that sounds too much like the National Rifle Association. And somebody else said, well, how about the uh, National Geographic Society? We're doing for space what they did for geography with the Glossy Magazine. And they said, well, that it might be confusion. Anyway, we set up with a solid sounding name, the Institute, and became the National Space Institute. From the very beginning, Jim Fletcher, who was very favorable about this, said to back off. He said, oh, we can't be too close to what you guys are doing. They might criticize me. So he signed a man named E.C. Gray to be sort of his intermediary uh, with NASA while all this was taking place. 
And there was also the, the, a lot of concern in the new society that we might be accused of being lobbyists. So we had to make certain that our bylaws and the Constitution and so forth would make it certain that we're not, we're pro-space, but we're not lobbyists for, for NASA or for, the, or for the Department of Defense. Uh, working in that period uh, was very exciting for me. I was working at now for the, I'd come up from Huntsville to work for the National Science Foundation on a, on a project that we had started. And then, uh, you remember, remember the, auto, the uh, Arab oil embargo of 1973-74, which led to President Ford administration setting up the Energy Research and Development Administration. And I was tagged by uh, Robert Siemens, who was the former Deputy Administrator of NASA, to join his office uh, in the brand new Energy Research and Development Administration. So I started working for there, but I'm in Washington uh, doing the creation of the National uh, Space Institute with the charisma of Verna von Braun as the leader of the new institute. And people like Terry Dawson was working with us and Chuck Hewitt came in as the executive director. And we had other uh, leading pe people. Uh, von Braun reached out to the general public and notables like Hugh Dawson came. Uh, came in and Bob Hope came in. Uh, we brought in all kinds of people, John Denver, the singer, uh, James Mitchell, the author, and so forth, to, to reach out to the great public, but get, it, get very well-known names uh, to a uh, supporter. Jack Cousteau also came in uh, as a, a, on our uh, advisory boards and so forth. And we get, did get, because of Bob Brown's charisma and name, he was a rock star in those days, and he had a lot of influence he brought in we get, did get funding from Boeing, uh, from Rockwell, from TRW, from uh, I think it was Convair Astronautics out in California, which became General Dynamics, uh, uh, and many other companies. We also uh, took advantage of a work dispute between the aerospace and defense industry and uh, uh, the, the companies, and the, we, 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 there was an institutional uh, uh, debate and we took advantage of a solution that they made and the, and the, the, the union uh, and, and industry resolved their disputes and we got a nice hunk of cash on the uh, 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 resolution of that dispute that gave us good, nice funding to begin with. And one other uh, very interesting thing that happened back in those days was Howard Hughes had offered to give the National Space Institute a donation of a million dollars if Verna von Braun would go to his home that he had in those days in Mexico and spend a weekend with him. Well, by this time, Verna von Braun had been di diagnosed with cancer. His health was deteriorating. We're now uh, you know, moving on to it. He died in 1977 at the age of only 60, uh, 65 years of age. So the doctors told him to turn that offer down. It was one of the amusing sidelights of, uh, of all of this. Uh, and so we, we were building up. I'm, I'm now going to stop at the, from the early days of the National Space Institute. I was there. I kept very, very accurate records of all that happened. I interviewed a lot of people to make sure they wouldn't be lost. That material is in the Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama, at the, in the archives. And uh, someday we, I, I may publish uh, something further on that. But those are the early days of the... Uh, uh, and I'm not even certain myself. We, our bylaws were all approved in 1974, I remember. Uh, but, but the uh, word is that from Terry Dawson, he thinks that it was legally only began in January 75. So I'm not certain without having access to my archives whether we were 74 or 75. But in the other event, we got started at the same time at L5, and the rest is the, is the story of the amalgamation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Fred. We appreciate you keeping that uh, that archive. We've actually come across some some uh, some letters that we found in storage on Von Braun's uh, 60th birthday. He had a, a a host of celebrities who wrote him personal letters, including Ro uh, Walter Cronkite and some Apollo folks. And we've just come across that, so we're going to make that available. There were all kinds of events that his charisma allowed. We had them in Texas with big, big events of, with a lot of celebrities involved. I mean, that yep. went on and uh, for a long time. But the, the loss of Verna von Braun, though, was, was terrible for the 
uh, of the National Space Institute, sure. 1977, yeah. just two years after it was started. And, and, and you and I had the privilege of celebrating his hundredth, the uh, anniversary of his hundredth birthday uh, about a month ago down in, down in Huntsville. We had, yeah, yeah. He and, was uh, born on the 23rd of, uh, of March, 1912. We celebrated in Huntsville, Alabama. And I sent up here a bunch of, of the brochures. About that's right. Everything. I guess that's you right. distributed them. That's right. Uh, we had a big thing, about almost 800 people uh, at his uh, birthday party uh, at the uh, U.S. Space and Rocket Center underneath the beautifully restored Saturn V 500DF, Dynamic Testing, F Facilities Testing, which got a grant from the uh, Save America's Treasures uh, through the uh, National Park Service. And I was on the board from the beginning of that, and we raised the money, the, 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 the many millions we raised, to restore that with an initial grant of $750,000 from the National Park Service, Saving America's Treasures. And we raised the money. It's a beautiful rocket is in Huntsville, completely restored to its original condition, and it is one of America's treasures today. It really is. It really is. It was a great night. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Appreciate welcome. it. And we'll, uh, we'll move right along to, uh, to Ben. And Ben, uh, I'd like to pass along again my congratulations for your award yesterday, and it's, uh, uh, it's always a privilege to have you here. And um, the proclamation that's in your uh, program was signed by Ben on the 28th of March of 1987. So Ben, we look forward to your comments. Yes, my, my job as president of the National Space Institute during the merger negotiations was to be above the fray. Gordon Woodcock and I got along very well together but there were elements in the two different organizations that were kind of antagonistic. Uh, people in the National Space Institute regarded uh, L5 as a bunch of wild-eyed uh, uh, fanatics. People in L5, some people in L5, regarded the National Space Institute as a bunch of old farts. <laughs> But I always felt that both organizations really had the same aim, to promote human expansion into space. The ideals and the techniques might have been different, but I felt that the merger would be a wonderful thing because people in the National Space Institute were sort of, uh, by and large, Washington insiders. They knew how to manipulate the government to a certain extent. The L5 Society had all this energy and enthusiasm and far looks. Uh, and it was sort of a, an irresistible force meeting an immovable object. But with goodwill on both sides, we got the merger accomplished and we moved on. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate that. Um, <laughs> So we've touched on, uh, on the NSI, NSI side of things, and uh, Art, you were involved in both organizations, and uh, Art and I had the great privilege of spending the actual anniversary, the 28th of March of this year, uh, traveling, I traveled down to Texas, he just drove a few hours from his home, uh, to just north of, uh, of Houston, where we presented the Robert A. Heinlein Memorial Award to Dr. Stephen Hawking, and uh, Art, uh, 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 joined us for that, uh, made, made some, some comments. Uh, the, the video, I believe, is going to be up on our website. We showed it at the, uh, at the gala the other night. But uh, we couldn't think of a more fitting way to spend the, the actual 25th anniversary than uh, presenting that prestigious award to, to Stephen Hawking. And, uh, and uh, I appreciate you being there, Art, and here today. So do you. Okay. Well, I, I recall sitting down to eat dinner out on that beautiful ranch that the Mitchells have and realizing that the person that is the heir to Einstein and Newton and Bohr was sitting two spaces over and he had written down thoughts that maybe a handful of people in the world could understand and that might give us true interstellar space flight someday by letting us actually understand how space-time works sometime from now. And this and, person thought that one of the most important things he could do with his life, as challenged as he is, is to motivate us to get humanity off the planet so that we can survive. And 
I'd like to say that Ben has correctly pointed out that not everybody in the L5 society, in fact, in a polite way, let's just say that some of them thought that the merger was a very bad idea. But Ben managed to work it through. I got to see both sides. I was on both boards. And the L5 society was finally convinced by saying that the, the grassroots passion, the grassroots energy of the society would just overwhelm all of these old suits in Washington. And what's actually happened is we have an enormous hybrid vigor. And I've written that down in the program book. The, uh, Paul was nice enough to ask me to write a few words for the program book, so you, I won't repeat them now. You can read them. But one of the strong legs was the L5 Society, created by Keith and Carolyn Henson in response in 1975 to the development of the concept of a L5 space habitat by Professor O'Neill at Princeton. And he did this, by the way, as a, in Princeton, did this as a challenge to his engineering students. Where is the best place to create an industrial civilization? Is it on Earth or is it on the moon? And they came back and they said, it isn't either, Professor, it's between the Earth and the moon. That's the best place with energy and raw materials and access to everything. So the L5 Society was started by a group of enthusiasts who realized that the work that Buzz and Neil had done going to the moon and all the tens of thousands of American workers with NASA had to be followed up. And we had a lot of science fiction writers because we figured that why not write it as science fiction and then go do it. So I ha when they asked me to speak here, I went back into my archives and I found a picture of the 1982 board meeting of the L5 Society. Now, I was sitting next to Robert Heinlein, I'm now his literary executor, and this is a picture that was taken at the L5 Society board meeting in 1982. It shows Robert Heinlein and Ambassador Finch and Jerry Pornell up at the podium, and this is five minutes before he turned and said, Art, would you run the second annual conference to make this an annual conference? Well, I asked Robert Heinlein last night what he would say to this group, and it's on the bottom of this. You probably can't read it. It says, why aren't we on Mars yet? <laughs> now, Larry, aside from being an enthusiast, is also the deputy administrator of NASA. So I'm going to point that right at you, Larry. <laughs> let's, let's, let's go to Mars. Now, the other thing I found was this poster. This was the poster from the second annual conference where we had 800 people in Houston, Texas over Easter weekend. But the interesting thing, the original artwork is next to me. I, I had it in my office. About half of those people were NASA engineers from the Johnson Space Center. The other half were wild-eyed science fiction enthusiasts who occasionally would put on a t-shirt. And they cross-fertilized each other. And that, that could have predicted the enthusiasm that we have now in the National Space Society that Paul's leading and that Fred took and championed so well. So we have this hybrid vigor. What do we do for the future? I'd just like to say that I think the best times are ahead of this society, not behind it. The first publication of the L5 Society was a four-page mimeographed booklet. But within two years, it had become a magazine that talked about space solar power, mining, the, the initial legal debates on the Moon Treaty were done in the L5 Society magazine and only afterwards were printed in the Houston Journal of International Law. The society is relevant to what we're doing today as we move into commercialization. It has been an educational tool to teach a generation of people how to do private space activities and how to work with the government to do it.
So I think that when we're on the moon, our children, our grandchildren, or on Mars, or under other suns, they'll read the history of this time, and they'll see this recording, because it will go with them to the stars. We have a big job to do. I'd like to ask every one of you to ask yourself if you can volunteer in some way to help the society. Send money, write to a politician, take and volunteer for a group like the chapters we have all over the country, but get involved. Most of you are involved. Get more involved. Get other people involved. So I guess I want to look not to the heritage that we already have, but to the heritage we're going to have in the future. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Art, and uh, thank you for bringing those, uh, those props with you. They're, they're, they're fantastic. If you actually get a chance, come up and, and, and look at the, uh, the artwork pretty closely. There's some pretty neat features in there. Um, and thanks for those words. Uh, you know, it really is an honor for me to have taken this, uh, taken this position and to take, uh, take the, uh, the NSS into starting our next 25 years. And I'm, I'm, I'm really honored to be in this, in this role, and I'm very much honored to have these uh, these previous distinguished leaders uh, are with us. Uh, I'm going to save my question, my moderator prerogative question for the end, and I'm going to I'm going to open it up to the uh, to the audience because I, I, I would like to tie this up towards looking toward the future. Um, and we saw some of that future f happen right here on this stage with our very own NASA Administrator General Bolden, and up on the screen watching the uh, the Dragon uh, spacecraft. Uh, grapple at the, uh, at the International Space Station. And I think for those of us who are true believers, we knew that that was going to be the outcome. Um, and I think we also uh, think that you ain't seen nothing yet. It's just the beginning of, of it really is opening up the, the, the new era. And, and Lori, as your role as uh, Deputy uh, Administrator, uh, we have to pass our congratulations to you as well for your, for your role in really making that happen. So, um, as I said, I'm going to save my, uh, my question for sort of uh, the wrap-up. So what I'd like to do is, uh, if we have some microphones floating around in the audience, if we, if, if we don't, we, we might just have to speak up. But what I'd like to do first is, uh, how many uh, former L5ers do we have in the audience? Let's see. Wow, look at that. How many, uh, how many former NSI folks? Pretty, pretty, pretty good split there. I don't know, is it possible to be part of both, both organizations? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so uh, so there we are. Um, so let's go ahead and open it up to the uh, to the audience for, for questions. Um, we we have about 16 minutes, so um, try to keep your your questions uh, uh, brief, if you will. To the gentleman in the front row, you get the fir you get the honor, sir. I think what uh, what should guide us in the future is to hold on to the leadership that Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo gave us, and make sure we don't uh, put ourselves in a position, uh, as I could see easily happening, uh, of Chinese tachinauts welcoming NASA astronauts to the moon. Uh, I believe we've done that, and we should lead the activities at the moon in an international lunar authority or corporation through the International Lunar Research Park Assembly, which will be practiced on the big island of Hawaii. And that we should look very carefully at what are the stepping stones to uh, Phobos or Deimos, where we will assemble on the surface of Mars in a like manner as we assemble the research park on the south pole of the moon from uh, Earth Moon L2, we'll use either Phobos or Deimos to put astronaut mission controllers controlling the assembly of the base on the moon, on the Mars. And once people descend down to the surface of Mars, uh, that's their home for the rest of their life. Thank you. 
If I, if I could just quickly respond, Paul mentioned I'm coming from the other side of the world. I was in Japan, and uh, I would say we were talking about many of these things, of how the U.S. absolutely, in my view, is continuing to lead this international effort. And at least from the Japanese perspective, that's a really important, as you can imagine, juxtaposed with China for them, that we continue to be the, the leaders in that and pledge to be there with us. And I would just note that uh, as I've said a lot, I have the best job at NASA as the deputy because while Charlie was here uh, with you all during the docking, which would have been great, it was the middle of night in Japan and I was singing Rocket Man in a karaoke bar. So, <laughs> Watching it on my iPhone. Ah. Uh, for, question for Lori Garver. Um, as has been lamented in multiple sessions, uh, the issue is whether space is going to become an issue in the elections. And folks have said it hasn't. Well, that's not exactly true. Usually every election, it pops up somewhere. It's normally because either John Kerry's in a bunny suit or Newt Gingrich talks about moon bases, and then it goes away. But something a little bit different has happened this time. Gingrich had his moment, and unfortunately, the media shot him down. But now the Obama campaign has been putting out a steady spate of statements and releases and so forth which is unusual because normally they don't, it's not a preemptive effort. And yet if you look at the um, Romney campaign, you can't quite figure out who's saying what and where. Can you speak for the administration as to whether space is actually going to be an issue beyond just a reactive so, one? Uh, is Keith, let me just interject. Is, do you have a question about the, the, heritage, the heritage panel? No, okay. okay. Uh, okay. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> I'll work in some heritage for you, Keith. Um, no, I, I don't mind answering. Uh, as a, a political appointee, uh, it's okay for me to do that. I know other civil servants have to stay away from it more. Uh, I've been involved in campaigns since John Glenn's presidential campaign in 83. That's why I came to town. And uh, presidents make space policy. Uh, Congress, of course, passes budgets. But presidents make space policy, and it's a very important thing. And I've advised a lot of presidential candidates many of whom never became presidents. And I still think the debate is worthwhile to have on because we know space is not a partisan issue and we know that uh, incoming presidents often will set their thoughts and their policies in the campaign. So it has been, I think, a very uh, active year, as you said, Keith, uh, with lots of talk of uh, space development and I happen to believe that that is a positive thing. Uh, certainly when you are sitting president, as uh, you have President Obama now, we have our space policies out there. We're quite clear about our direction. We're quite maybe relieved that uh, we had a success this week in our direction because we know we would have been attacked otherwise. But I would find it very uh, interesting if the Republican Party decides to attack private enterprise in space. Uh, if, if if this happened, you know, things, things could happen, and I know some of the advisors would have done that, but I doubt we will see the presidential candidate doing that on the other side. But I think President Obama's policies are clear. He's um, called Elon this week to congratulate them. You know, he did a very hard thing in setting out a policy at the beginning of this administration that was not popular with the status quo. The easy thing would be to just keep hundreds of billions of dollars program going that was heading off a cliff. Uh, he didn't do that. He did the difficult thing, which is to say private enterprise has to take over low Earth orbit and we need to extend the space station. It can be that market for private sector going to and from space station. We in the government want to invest in technology and to get us uh, farther. We do know that um, has been controversial, but I think we'll be defending it all, uh, all year, and we'll see what the other side does. I'll adjust my question also to you, Lori. We, we've done pretty good in terms of the, uh, the former L5ers and uh, NSS in terms of getting our folks into NASA. And yet in my generation and younger, most people have, their only vision of where we could potentially be going as a nation is landing somewhere. They don't have visions of space settlements and colonies. They don't have visions of space solar power satellites. Why is it that we have not succeeded in getting that larger vision broadcast to the new generation? No, that's a great question. Um, it's, I, I would say success at getting people within NASA is, 
that's not really a, a goal as much uh, as other people have talked about. I think a lot of people outside of NASA uh, have made a lot of the advancements. We work for you. <laughs> Again, my role is much smaller working in the government. Uh, we work for the public, and so NSS and others being out there with that broader vision is important. Yes, within NASA, I have it, but um, it's not the government's role. Yes, I believe the government's unique role is as we uh, develop our investment strategy to do things that will allow it. But typically what you have in the government are folks that want to uh, do their program that exists, get their contract in their district. You know, the government is, that, that's why most of us want um, greater than just the government investment in space. We've been doing some scenario planning at NASA uh, looking at different futures beyond 25 years. I've been trying to get people to, just to think, well, maybe it won't always be sort of this Apollo-like destination-driven thing. So try a lot of ways to get people to see this. And one of the scenarios is settlement. But, you know, the leadership votes on the scenarios and like not, not getting all, all the votes because people think a more programmatic um, approach is what drives budgets. And it is true. Look at what happened these last few years. Missions uh, and programs and projects drive budgets. And so I, w I would just say government can do their part, and it's wonderful for those of us who decide we want to play a role, at least occasionally, in governments to help advance uh, space development. But the roles outside the government are even more important. I do. I cut my teeth in journalism. And the problem with space for the most of the public is what we call a giggle factor. They just don't believe. They just don't understand. And that's why this organization, the National Space Society, is so important. Because we have to do the job of educating the general public. Until the space vote bumps some politician out of office, we're not going to be successful. The government has a very important role to play in going into the future, but we know from history that there's no doubt that private enterprise will be the major movement into space, just like it was the major movement into this continent and into the Western Hemisphere and everywhere else. The entire government only gets about 25% of the gross domestic product, and NASA gets about half of 1% of that one half cent of each of your tax dollars. Now, that can do wonderful things, and they've managed and cherished this trust that the public has given them with extraordinary vigor and attention. But now we must take and take the $14 trillion economy of the United States, not to mention the rest of the world, and make a profit from space so we can begin going into space to earn new wealth for the society instead of just spending wealth. We don't spend almost anything on space. We probably spend more on astrology than we spend on astronomy. So let's, let's keep that in mind, that what NASA is doing is to take a very small amount of the public money and to catalyze the development of huge potential new industries like Colonel Aldrin mentioned. New parks, new industrial facilities, whole new ways of thinking about the world. If you go back just three or four years, we thought Mars was a dry planet, no water, maybe a little carbon dioxide at the poles. We now know, thanks to the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter team that we honored last night that there's enough water on Mars to cover the whole planet to a depth of 30 meters. Does anybody think we're not going to learn more than that when we get people on the moon and Mars? So I think that it's not a question of should we do it this way or that way. What we do is we do it together. And we've seen that just with Elon and his rocket. And there's going to be more of those rockets. So thank you very much. Uh, just a moment. I have to make an apology and a quick exit. I have a family obligation. I have to leave you. But go at it. Stay here for hours.
Uh, yes, I uh, had a question. Um, there's been a recurrent theme about how future space exploration will have to be an international effort. Buzz made comments earlier about an international organization putting people eventually on Mars. Can't the National Space Society grow into something like an international space society? What are your thoughts based on the kind of heritage model you've talked about earlier? Uh, that's, I think it's a very interesting question. That We do have an international uh, activity. The International Astronautical Federation, headquartered in Paris, has, is an amalgamation of, of, of space societies all over the world. Uh, there's an International Academy of Astronautics, also headquartered in Paris, that uh, it, it involves people from many, many places. I've been active with both of them. I was the only American president present in, in 1950 at the first International Astronautical Congress in Paris, and, and I've kept very active uh, uh, since then. And I think those organizations are leading the way, and they are an amalgamation of, of all of us. Uh, so I don't see a reason why the, we can't create, bring in members of the National Space Society from all over the world, but in, but in recognition that we, there are those international uh, organizations that do represent the whole lot of us. And of course, we are international. I know NSI and L5 both had about 10% international members at the merger. I don't know what it is now. But, and we have chapters, of course, thanks to Kirby I can we have the most in Australia of any other country. No, that's, abs that's absolutely right, and uh, we do have international chapters, international members. Our chairman of our board is from Australia, Kirby. Kirby's out there somewhere. Um, and we've had a series of meetings during this ISDC. Uh, the international aspect is uh, very much on the forefront of things that we're, we're working on right now. Um, we probably have time for one, maybe two really short questions. I know Dale wanted to ask a question. Uh, is the microphone out there? There we go. Okay, I'm actually going to talk about heritage. Uh, uh, Art, in particular, I wanted to mention to you both of the posters you have up there, I was there. Uh, and I have been spending a lot of time in the last 10 years collecting whatever materials I could, scanning them and getting them online. Uh, I do have as a resource that's available that you might be interested in getting into all of the old L5 news. And Anyone uh, like yourself who has materials or has, is interested in helping save that heritage that we've got, uh, I would be most appreciated if they uh, talk to me, because I can't do it myself. And every year that goes by, we lose more and more materials. They're in people's attics. If, if some of our older members uh, die, their families throw them away. I, I recently found out that all the videotapes from my conference uh, one of the, the person who had done the videotapes for me in Pittsburgh in 87, uh, he died young, and all the videotapes got thrown out. This is happening all over, and we need to do something to try to protect and save that heritage so those people in Alpha Centauri can see this stuff. We should digitize it. Thank you. Whoa. Um, my, my interest is looking forward in terms of where NSS should go. My experience in talking to people, with, it seems like the greatest breakthroughs in terms of science and engineering are when artists get involved or musicians and bring a whole new perspective to that equation. In San Diego, we've taken STEM and we've added art in to call it STEAM. And, uh, you know, it's huge. It's amazing what adding that perspective in will provide. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are in terms of that. We see beautiful artwork on the stage, and you know it just really preserves, and it brings that message out to the public, and it engages people on a whole new level. 
I, I would just quickly respond that I feel is one of the things that L5 brought from the um, merger was that uh, involvement of artists. We had Robert McCall before at the National Space Institute, but adding like Pat Rawlings in here. For, uh, in 1989, we decided we needed our own magazine. We had Space World magazine at the time of the merger, and the printing price has gone up, so I recommended we start doing this ourselves. It was just at the very beginning when you could start doing more on uh, the computer. And Ed Astra was the name that when Von Braun had uh, initially started the National Space Institute, they called the mag magazine that. So every month we reached out, it was monthly back then, to artists, and it was an incredible way to express the vision. But Robert McCall also was extremely involved in the Space Institute, continued his involvement throughout, and it's been, I think, really meaningful um, to both organizations and, and uh, should be in the future. Thank you so much, and, and I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up. I'm gonna take my question. Um, uh, so. We've, we've reflected on the past and all, and, I, and I've said throughout the conference that we want to do it with an eye toward the, uh, the future. And I'm a, uh, I'm a big proponent of, of taking the, uh, the wise, wise counsel of, of others, and certainly the wise counsel of uh, these esteemed uh, leaders of our, of our organizations. And uh, I'd just like to wrap up with uh, just your closing thoughts on uh, on what we can do as the National Space Society going forward into the next 25 years. And, um, you know, as I said, I, I, I really do take uh, the wise counsel of others uh, to heart and uh, just like to take an opportunity for, for you all just to have your, your closing comments as we wrap up. Comments is to continue to bring together the professionals and the you might say the amateurs, those who are passionate about space but not necessarily working in the field. I'm the guy that worked in the field and am passionate about space. And I think we've got to continue that. I grew up, I know I found a letter to my mommy and daddy when I was eight years old. Please give me a copy for Christmas of Lost on the Moon by Roy Rockwood. I became fascinated in science fiction. I built up a beautiful science fiction collection of magazines going back to the 20s. I gave it to Harvard University a number of years ago. Uh, all the magazines that brought me up. Then I also joined the American Rock Society when I was 12 as a student member. And I've been a member of the, that was the precursor to the American Institute of Astronautics and Astronauts. I tried to close these two worlds and bring them together, the imagination and the practicality. And I think that's something that the society should continue to do, bring in people who are passionate about space and m meld them together with uh, those of us who work in the space field but are still passionate. And I think that message, I think, would be very important as we continue uh, our operations in the years ahead. So I've thought a lot about this as the Space Society has evolved over the years and uh, a lot of new groups have sprung up, and even just since since I left, which doesn't just seems like yesterday, as I look at a lot of you. And to me, that is the unique character of the organization, which could be brought out more. Uh, people who don't necessarily work in the field, lots of us who work in the field also feel passionately about it and are, are members and active with the Space Society. But when you look at most of the other organizations, AIAA, even the Space Foundation in Colorado Springs, it's, they aren't meeting Memorial Day. They're not here on their Memorial Day. Uh, they are here because, for the most part, you know, they're getting a paycheck and their job depends on it. The uniqueness of the Space Society and the views as brought together with a merger are that this is important for our future. And it's something bigger. It's a cause. And I think that as you have shaped, in my view, our policies going forward, you, you could take the success of this week and continue to build on that and saying, you know, this is our space program. This is the public's space program, and there's the government-funded part, there's all the rest, uh, but really being as vocal as possible through all the new venues that you have now uh, to make that really, really clear. And broadening it, I think, beyond just engineers, this last question of, 
artists, musicians. We've tried, you know, the NASA brand is still a pretty good one, and we've gotten some good uh, wins, getting Bono, U2, to film from space at his concerts, and a lot of really wonderful um, Will I Am is gonna, gonna um, premiere a song on August 5th with the Mars landing. We spent a lot of time with him at the launch because they have outreach to the broader public, and that's a, a wonderful thing, and the Space Society could really capitalize on that. When I was at the Space Society, we tried a lot of that. We did great outreach with Star Trek, dinners on the set, the cast did public service announcements. With the Apollo 13 movie came out, we had Tom Hanks uh, at a number of events, and he then went and testified for the space station's future because of the Space Society, because he was involved. I think leveraging on a lot of that is something I would encourage the Space Society to do. I'd just like to thank the National Space Society for being such a wonderful tool for change, for education, for discussion. Progress is only made when you have tension. Yes, we have tension between the government, the private sector, educational. There are many competing needs. Our society is a forum for the discussion and understanding of these and for the communication of their importance to the public, as has been mentioned so well here. I want to congratulate Paul and his staff on continuing to pour the grassroots fire onto the American aerospace genius. If we get up to one cent of the gross national product in space through NASA or privately, we will continue to lead the world to go to the Shackleton base on the moon, to the Mars bases, and in doing so, we will become rich both in material things and spiritually as we learn more about our universe. So thank you, Paul. Thank you, members of the National Space Society. Now let's please thank our panelists. Uh, so we are running quite a bit behind, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and break and we'll see you at lunch. Thank you.